I'm Heidi Fishman, and today I'm going to tell you the story about how my mother survived the Holocaust. So she was born in 1935 in Cologne, Germany, and at that time, Hitler was already coming to power. So by 1936, my grandfather decided it was time to get out of Germany, and he moved the family to Amsterdam. It was a pretty easy move for the family because my grandfather was a metals commodities trader, and his boss was Jewish, the firm was Jewish, and his boss decided he was going to move the whole firm to Amsterdam to get out of Germany. So he was able to move with his whole job. So the family got up and left, and it was my mother, my grandparents, and then both sets of my mother's grandparents also moved, and they all settled in Amsterdam. Things were okay for a while. My uncle Robbie was born in 1938, and again, things were going okay. But in 1940, the Nazis invaded the Netherlands. Nobody expected this. In, 19, um, in the World War I, the Netherlands had stayed neutral, and they never expected to be drawn into this war. But nonetheless, the Nazis invaded. My mother, she's, her real name is Ruth, but she goes by Tootie, her little brother Robbie. This is a picture of them from 1940. My grandparents, Heinz and Margaret Lichtenstern. And this is a picture of um, the Nazis coming into Amsterdam. And you can see all the people greeting them with the Heil Hitler salute. The Nazis did not um, change people's lives very much right away. They changed their rules very, very slowly. And it was a, it was a gradual buildup of things are getting worse, they're getting worse. In 1941, my grandfather took all the extra money he could get his hands on. He helped, uh, he asked friends if they had extra money and they wanted to do the same thing. People contributed and they gave their extra money to this man, Eckbert de Jung. Eckbert was not Jewish. He was the Reichs Minister for Non-Ferrous Metals for the Netherlands, which meant that he was the administrator in charge of all international metal buying and selling that happened in and out of the Netherlands. The reason why my grandfather wanted to give Eckbert his money is because when he left the Netherlands, when he left Germany to go to the Netherlands in 1936, there was a flight tax. The German Reich uh, said anywhere between 25% and then it kept going up, up to 95% of your assets had to be given to the Reich in order to have the um, ability to leave the country. So they were basically stealing pe people's money. And my grandfather knew that they'd come after anything he had left. So he gave his money to Eckbert and he said, please keep this safe for me. They won't come after you. And if there's anything you can do to help me, to help my friends, use this money in order to help us. The rules that they were putting on the Jews then started to increase. So here's some examples. This says for Aryans only. So Jews could not sit on this bench. There were stores that had, this is J-O-O-D, is Jew in Dutch. The Germans would come by and they'd write, this was a Jewish store. If you were Jewish, you could shop there, but if you were not Jewish, you could not shop there. And if you were Jewish, you couldn't go into a non-Jews store to, bu to buy something. Jews could only see Jewish doctors. Jews couldn't go to the theater anymore. They couldn't go to the park. They couldn't go to the public swimming pool. There was all kinds of rules. Here we see the Jewish quarter in Amsterdam. They were told they had to live in this section of town and other, not other, sec other sections of town. And here it says Jews are forbidden. Jews are not welcome. This is not that different than issues that were going on in the United States before civil rights came about when the Jim Crow laws, blacks versus whites. It was segregation. If we can keep people separate, it'll be easier to take care of them, which is what they were going to do later. When I say take care of them, I say that in quotes because we know the final solution was coming. This is my grandmother's identification card. There's a big J right here, which shows that she's Jewish. If she was 
pulled over by a policeman for some reason, a soldier, she would have to show that. And when I say pulled over, I mean when she's walking down the sidewalk, because of course Jews were not allowed to have cars anymore, or ride in the trams, or have bicycles. This is my mother's card. Uh, she was younger, so she didn't have to have this fancy ID with her picture. She was only five years old. But the most important thing here is this word right here, fear, which means four. And the question is, how many of your grandparents are Jewish? If you had four Jewish grandparents, you were a full Jew. If you had two Jewish grandparents, you were a half Jew. So that meant, at the beginning, the Nazis treated you a little better if you weren't a full Jew. But by the end of the war, that didn't matter anymore. This is my mother's school picture. We all know what, we, all, we still have our kids line up and have the school picture. And here's mom in the yellow circle. And if you look closely, every one of these kids is wearing the yellow star. This was the Jewish school. The kids were no longer allowed to go to the public school and be integrated with the rest of the uh, kids in town. They were separating the two sets of people. What I notice about this picture, too, is how many children there are for one teacher. And that's because a lot of the younger adults were being already rounded up and taken away, especially the Jewish ones, and they were sent to work camps and such. All right, life in Amsterdam. They had started out in a very, very nice apartment, and then my grandparents had to move the family into the smaller apartment in the Jewish quarter. And every night, basically, somewhere in town, they had what they called razzias. A razzia is a roundup. And the Nazis would come with their trucks. Um, they'd cordon off parts of either end of a street, and they'd round people up and say, Jews, Jews, everybody out. Put them in a truck and take them away. My mom has a very strong memory of, of one particular razzia. She was at this window here. And this was the view out of her window. And she was carrying a, a pink stuffed animal or a doll with pink um, cloth on it that was very bright. And she was watching the roundup out the window. And somebody in the apartment, she doesn't remember who it was, grabbed her from behind, yanked her away from the window, took the doll away from her, and said, you have to stay away from the window. You have to stay away, especially with that pink that big pink brightness. We don't want them to look up and see us. Basically, the family was going through their lives trying to be not noticed. You don't want the Germans to notice that you're there, to take a look at you, to notice you're Jewish, to look at your ID, because then they might take you away. As long as you can be relatively incognito, maybe they'll leave you. In 1943, here's a picture of my mother and my uncle, 1943. My grandfather decided they were going to go into hiding. I believe it was because that they were called up, which meant they were supposed to report for transport. My grandfather wasn't going to just go when they asked him to. And they went here. I'm 99% sure this is the room that they were hiding in. If it wasn't this one, it was the one right next door that looked virtually the same. A friend of my grandfather's, his name was Leopold um, Klopfer lived at this apartment building, and this was their storage room upstairs. And he put the family up in the attic in the storage room, and a little bit like Anne Frank, except it wasn't as thought out as the Anne Frank situation. There was no secret door behind a bookcase. There was not a set of supplies for a couple years. It was just a spur of the moment thing. They stayed in the attic for three or four weeks. My mom isn't really sure. And then my grandfather became very, very scared, claustrophobic. And he basically was saying, if we're found here, they'll shoot us. They'll send the Klopfers to a concentration camp. We can't do that to them. Um, we're going to leave the attic. And so they did leave the attic. And they went back home to their apartment. But one reason they did is because Eckbert had done something amazing. Eckbert came to my grandfather and had given him this passport. What's important about this passport is it's from the Republic of Paraguay. It covers the whole family, grandfather, my grandfather, my grandmother, my mother, my uncle. And it 
is issued out of Bern, Switzerland. So this says the family is Paraguayan. Why is that important? The Nazis were not fighting Paraguay. South America was not involved in World War II, and they didn't need another country getting mad at them. They decided that South American Jews that happened to be in Europe at the time of the war would get better, um, better treatment. They were not sent to any of the death camps. They were sent to concentration camps, but they were held as political prisoners that would be exchanged for German POWs or German nationals that were um, in allied countries that wanted to come home. So this gave you a better shot with the Nazis. One of the things that's really incredible about this passport, though, is it did not come actually from Paraguay. It was not issued by the Paraguayans. In recent years, just in the last year and a half, it's been found out that a group of Polish diplomats that were in Switzerland were the ones creating this passport and, and, and many more. There's one man whose handwriting, this handwriting, which is very distinctive, is on over a thousand passports. And what was happening was they would, the Polish diplomats would get some money from a Jewish organization, either from the United States or in Switzerland or wherever they could. They would bribe the Paraguayan consul in Switzerland, get a blank passport, then they would go back to their offices, fill in the information about a family that was Jewish, um, go back to the Paraguayan consul, get it stamped, signed, and then they'd either get it smuggled or throw it in the mail and hope it would get to where it needed to go. And they were sending these all over Europe trying to save Jews. What's fascinating, it was a group of three three non-Jewish Polish diplomats and three Jews working together to create this um, rescue operation. So my grandfather had the passport. He figured they would be safe. Turns out that didn't work. They ended up getting taken to this building, which is called the Jewish Theater. I can't quite say in Dutch right, the Jods Schauburg. And that's where the Nazis kept bringing all the Jews from Amsterdam. My mom says she was in that room in the theater for two, three days. They weren't given any food. It was dark. Um, it was just the emergency lights that were on the sides, on the walls. All the seats had been ripped out of the audience area, and hundreds of people were in there. Uh, the bathroom situation was... Um, not good, just a couple of bathrooms for if you go to a play, not set up for people living there for days and days. And then after a few days, they're put on a transport and brought to Westerbork. This is a pretty iconic picture of Westerbork. You show this to anybody in Holland, they know this picture. This street was called the Boulevard of Misery. You can see a tra transport here. Here's the train with the boxcars. It looks like these people have fairly recently arrived, and all the barracks on either side. The train would come in from one side, from Amsterdam, drop people off. They might be there for a few weeks. It was a transit camp, which meant people just stay there for a little while, and then they're put back on the train and taken east to po Poland, to one of the, um, the, the camps where there were death camps. It used to be Poland. It was now Nazi-occupied. When they were first sent to this camp, they were put in this little section here. You can see there's extra barbed wire here. And that was the prisoner section. So they were prisoners separated in the camp in an even more confined area than the rest of the camp because they hadn't turned themselves in when they were supposed to. They were prisoners within the prison. Then what happened was my grandfather, who was a metals commodities trader, and some of his friends who were also here, and Eckbert, figured out a way to turn the transit camp into a work camp. You can see there's a lot of metal right here in the foreground of this picture. They set it up so that uh, scrap metal would be brought to Westerbork. The Jews would be put to work separating the metal. We've got the, our aluminum, our copper, our cables, whatever, whatever the different things are. 
separate the metal, and then it would be sent off to smelters and the Third Reich could use that metal. Why would they help the Nazis? Well, by doing that, they were keeping Jews in Westerbork so that they wouldn't be sent to the death camps. And after a month in Westerbork, the Lichtenstern family, Heinz, Margaret, Robert, and Ruth, that's, that's my mom and her family, were released. This form is saying people that were released on a certain day. They're sent back to Amsterdam. So my grandfather set up this deal about using the camp for scrap metal. And because of that, he's released, sent to Amsterdam, because they need somebody in the city to keep making the deals, to find out where the scrap is, to have it sent to Westerbork. The last four months of 1943, production changed from five people to 1,200 people separating the metal. So that's 1,200 Jews that were not being sent east. And my grandfather's in Amsterdam helping create this uh, deal. Two other families, the Sachs family and the Ober Oberlander family, were all, these were also metal dealers, and they were in on part of this production. Now the best part about all this, here we have the picture again with the, the metal in the foreground, was that Eckbert was in, in cahoots with the resistance. So the Jews would be separating the metal, put the different piles out, it would go off to the smelters, and a certain percentage of those smelters would take the metal, mix it back up, and send it back to the camp so the Jews would be separating that same metal again. So they were constantly working, but not producing a whole lot. The Nazis didn't get as much as they might have if they had Germans separating the metal. What they were also doing was they were putting as much impurities into these piles of metal as possible so that the metal wouldn't have the right um, consistency and it wouldn't work correctly when it was turned into a submarine or a tank or whatever, they tried to weaken the metal. So if you put gravel in with the aluminum or copper in with the steel, I, again, you have to know your chemistry, but if you do that, then the metal doesn't work as well and the Nazis were getting bad metal. While this was going on, this is a very important piece of paper. This paper is from um, Adolf Eichmann's office. Adolf Eichmann was the Nazi in charge of the final solution. His job was to get all the Jews into the death camps to be exterminated. Albert Speer was the Nazi in charge of armaments and munitions. Speer wanted the, what he called the metal Jews to be left in the Netherlands to help find metal and create enough uh, pull the scrap together so that they could use it to build their munitions. Eichmann wanted the Jews sent east. I found several of these letters that went back and forth between the two offices arguing what to do with these men. And my grandfather, his name is right here, is named always first on the list with these metal Jews. And in February 1944, Eichmann wins the, the argument and the family is sent back to Westerbork. While they're in Westerbork, um, sort of life goes on, but my grandfather constantly goes to Amsterdam. The families in Westerbork, in the concentration camp, they're prisoners, and my grandfather's sent to Amsterdam to, to do some work and then come back again. It's kind of crazy. Um, I never heard of this before, before I started doing this research. But that's what was happening. And of course, he didn't run away because his family was there. They were basically hostages. In July 1944, he was able to buy a doll and bring it back to my mother and give it to her for her birthday. So it's her ninth birthday, and he gives her the doll. It was brand new. Now it's pretty old looking, but it was brand new at the time. And she's, and she's thrilled. She has a brand new doll. How many kids get a present like that while they're in a concentration camp? My grandfather pulls my mom aside and he says, look, the body is stuffed with rags, the head is hollow. It comes off if you untie this knot. 
I put money inside the head. It is your job to take care of that. So my grandfather took the doll, took the head off, showed my mom that it was hollow and that he put money inside it. Put, put the doll back together and said, Tootie, it is your job to take care of this doll. This is the only money we have with us at this point. Things are gonna get worse. You are in charge of our money. We might use this to bribe somebody, to get better treatment, to get extra food. We're going to need it. Don't let anybody take the doll from you, no matter what. A few months later in September, the family's put on one of these cattle cars and sent on to another camp. Here's a picture of my mom from 1944. So this is how old she is. And they're sent on to another camp. This camp is called Trezenstadt. It's in Terezin, uh, now the Czech Republic, then Czechoslovakia, um, pretty close to Prague. And this is a model of the camp that they have, uh, a model of the town that they have in a museum there. It was a fortress town that was built in the Middle Ages to keep invading armies out. So these big, large um, walls around the outside with a town inside, usually ar an army would live in there. And the Nazis found this great place that had walls around it and said if it can keep armies out, it can keep people in, and they turned it into a concentration camp slash ghetto. They were not actively killing Jews there, but the conditions were terrible. There was lice, there were bed bugs, there was not enough food, there was typhus. 33,000 people died in the camp just because of malnutrition and disease, with the Nazis not having to do anything other than not take care of them. The camp was also used to fool the Red Cross. The International Red Cross decided they needed to look at what, this, what was going on in Europe, see how the Jews were being treated by the Germans. And so this was the camp that was picked. And before the visit, the Germans went through and they painted the town, they had a cafe, a butcher shop, a bakery, um, and the Jews were told that they had to act like everything was wonderful. Uh, they would sit at the cafe and sip their imitation coffee while the Red Cross came through. There was all kinds of food in the, in the windows at the bakery. Of course, the Jews never got to eat that food. That went to the German soldiers. But they had to pretend, and the Red Cross was fooled. So it was considered a privileged camp, and everything was supposedly wonderful. After they were in Trezenstadt for about a month, this notice came out. And what it said was that all men between the ages of 16 and 55 were going to be sent east to build another camp. It was going to be a work camp. And um, there were going to be no exceptions. Everybody, all men that age group was going to go. And that included my grandfather. My mom tells the story that she was lying on her bunk one day and my grandfather basically came in, threw himself on her on the bunk, was crying bitter tears, saying goodbye to her, saying, I'm leaving tomorrow, I'll probably never see you again. Um, and, and really, that was the most upset she saw him through the entire experience. And just imagine if you're nine years old and your father comes to you and says goodbye, I'll never see you again. So he goes to the transport. And he's in line to actually get on the train, which was not going to a new work camp. It was actually going to Auschwitz. And somebody says to him, don't you have a Paraguayan passport? And he's like, yeah, but it doesn't do any good. I'm still here, aren't I? It didn't keep me out of this place. And they said, show it to somebody. And so he went to one of the German officials. He showed them the passport. And they handed him this piece of paper. This says Ausgeschieden, which means withdrawn, his camp number, his name, and then his birth date. So what happened was he showed the Paraguayan passport and he did not have to go to Auschwitz. He was given this little tiny piece of paper, it's about this long, and my grandmother kept that her whole life. I found it when I was going through some papers trying to do research for the book 
My mom had it stashed away in the house. She didn't even know she had it. Life in Traisenstadt, I'm going to tell you a couple of stories that my mom has told me. One is that everybody had a job. My grandmother's job was to work in the mica factory. Mica is a mineral and it comes in, it's, a, it's like a rock and it comes in these sheets that come apart. You can push them apart and those little sheets were used for airplane parts. It was the, it's something that you need your fingers and manual dexterity in order to be able to do this. And so it was the one building where people were working on the mica that was heated during um, that winter. And my grandmother's job was to go at four o'clock in the morning and light the wood stoves to warm up that room. And so she'd have to get up in the middle of the night to go. She lived in the women's and children's barracks with the kids. She would sleep on the bottom bunk, then my uncle Robbie in the middle bunk, and my mom on the top bunk. The barracks was a room that had 80 to 100 people in it, and it had a small bathroom with three or four sinks like this. My mom did not draw this. I found this when I was reading another book. Um, Helga Weiss is a survivor, and she was in the camp, and she drew these pictures when she was 12 years old. But my grandmother really thought that the only chance they have to survive Trace and Shot was to stay healthy. In order to stay healthy, she wanted the kids to be clean. So she'd wake them up at 3.30 in the morning and make them wash in the middle of the night when they could get to the bathroom and there wasn't a long line. No matter how cold it was, you wash yourself, head to toe, and then the kids could go back to bed and she would go off to the mica factory and light the wood stoves. Another story is about the food. The food was bad. Um, it wasn't enough. People were literally starving to death. And these are the pants that my grandfather wore during the war. It was his ski pants, old-fashioned style that's baggy in the middle with the cuff that's tight at the bottom. And his job was to work in the root cellar. The root cellar was there because there was plenty of vegetables that were being grown just outside the camp um, for the German guards and the SS that were there, not for the Jews. But he worked in the root cellar and he would have to separate the vegetables and the rotten stuff would go in the soup that the Jews would eventually get, the good stuff would go to the Germans. And there was one particular guard who would basically say to him, I'm gonna take a break, I'm gonna go get some cigarettes. You're on your own for 15 minutes with a wink and a nod. And my grandfather knew that meant he could take vegetables. And he would stuff them in his pants and then run over to the women's barracks give them to my grandmother, and then run back to the root cellar. Why did an SS man do this? Well, a couple years ago, just before Tootie's Promise was published, uh, we were in Germany talking to an old friend of my mother's and my grandparents, and um, my grandfather had told him why this happened. My, before the war, my grandfather was an international businessman he would travel all over. And when he was in Berlin, there was one particular very fancy hotel he liked to stay at with a fancy restaurant which he liked to eat at. And he used to tip the waiters very well, especially the head waiter at this hotel restaurant. Well, that head waiter turned out to be the guard in the root cellar. So my grandfather had been taking care of him before the war, and he returned the favor by giving my grandfather a chance to steal vegetables during the war. And so they lived at Traisenstadt until liberation. They did not have to go to Auschwitz. They were they able to stay. Unfortunately, my mother's maternal grandparents were on the last train from Traisenstadt to Auschwitz, but her paternal grandparents were also there with them at the camp. And this is a picture from liberation. The Russians liberated the camp. Um, everybody was a little bit nervous about the Russians because they had a pretty bad reputation about looting and pillaging and, and, and doing bad things, but they were actually very good to everybody. They fed them a lot of food, um, which in some cases did not go well because people who were starving, if you eat too much food that's too heavy, your system can't take it. So some people ended up dying while they were being refed. 
And then it took a couple months to get back to Amsterdam. This is a picture of an American soldier. Uh, one of the stops that the family made on their way to Amsterdam was in Pilsen. This soldier's name is Lloyd Miller. And he sort of befriended the family. And my mom had a huge crush on him. She was 10. He was probably, I don't know, 20, 22 or something. She was like, oh, he's such a handsome soldier. Um, but one of the things that Lloyd Miller did was he gave her chewing gum. Robbie and Tootie had never had chewing gum before. And they were sort of eating it like candy. And he finally explained to them, you just chew it. You don't swallow it. And then at the end of the day, she asked, well, what do I do with it at night? And he was joking around. He said, oh, American kids put it behind their ear at night. And she did put it behind her ear at night. And the next morning, it was all tangled up in her hair. And um, my grandmother had to cut her hair in order to get her uh, whatever, to get the gum out. And this is a document of their repatriation. It was very, very difficult to get back to Amsterdam, to get back into the Netherlands, because they were stateless Jews. They did not belong in the Netherlands as far as the Dutch were concerned. They had their own problems. They had enough Dutch refugees. They didn't want to take in the stateless people. Um, so there was all these barriers and all these hoops to go through, and they had to get all these different stamps about whether they had a place to go, and if they had any money, and if they were healthy enough. Um, when they got to Amsterdam, they had nothing. They really had pretty much nothing. And my grandfather called a friend of his who he had given a lot of his belongings to for safekeeping. Not Egbert, who he had given the money to, but someone he had given their paintings and their silver and their furniture and my grandmother's fur coat, things like that. And he said, we survived. We're back. It's unbelievable, but we're here. We don't have anywhere to go. Can we stay with you? And this man just said to him, no, um, I'm busy tonight. We were promised the Jews wouldn't come back. He had been a Nazi collaborator, and he had sold off all of the family's possessions for the cash and gone through the cash. So even though there were people that you could trust that helped you, like Egbert de Young, there was also people like this Robert Koch who took all their possessions and didn't give them anything back. They were able to settle in the Netherlands eventually. They, um, Egbert gave the family back all the money he did not spend on passports. And my grandfather had his job again in the metals trading firm. Um, it's bittersweet. Out of 100 people that worked for the firm, only about 10 or 12 survived. So my grandfather became the director. And um, he, made, he was able to make a living again. But at the expense of the lives of his friends. Uh, here's a picture of the family in 1967. They're on vacation. You can see they're doing well. Um, they stayed in Amsterdam until 1950 when the Korean War started. And then my grandfather got very afraid that the communists would sweep across Europe and that Amsterdam wouldn't be safe again. So at that point, the family moved to Brazil. They stayed there for a few years, and then they finally came to the United States in the 50s. My mom is now a naturalized citizen. Um, she met my father. They're married. You know, they got married. Three kids, seven grandchildren, and things are good. Um, I want to give you a few statistics. Of the nine million Jews of, in Europe before the war, six million were murdered. Of the six million, one and a half million were children. And of the 140,000 Jews in the Netherlands, 107,000 were murdered. Here's some more statistics. The one of these that stands out to me the most is this one. Of the 15,000 children in Traisenstadt, only 132 are known to survive. And my mom and my uncle are two of them. The statistics. The chances of them making it are so, were so low. They were so lucky. And only because people, like the people behind the passport operation, uh, the SS soldier that gave them extra food, only because there were people like that did they make it. 
I also want to point out that it wasn't only the Jews that the Nazis had it in for. All these different groups. If you were a gypsy, if you were mentally disabled, if you had a physical handicap, if you were a Jehovah's Witness, if you were black, if you were gay, they would murder you too. It wasn't just the Jews. There were six million Jews that were murdered, but from these groups we have another five million that were sent to the gas chambers. So this was not just a Jewish story. This is a very universal story. Lots of people were hated because they were somewhat different. They were not seen as Aryan, and they were not seen as desirable to add to the gene pool. That is what the Nazis were doing. They were trying to purify the gene pool. Okay. Here's a picture of my mom with the doll. She still has it. It's actually at a, um, at the University of Hartford in Connecticut in their um, Museum for Jewish Heritage. My mom and I at a Kristallnacht commemoration. My mom still goes to school. She still tells her story, but I have put it also in the book because there'll be a point where she can't do that anymore. And I want the story to be around forever. Why do I want the story around forever? Because the world still hasn't learned. We're still putting people in concentration camps. Right now they're going on, there's concentration camps in China. Um, in Syria, they gassed their own people. Uh, Rwanda, uh, Darfur, there's still genocides all over the world. Bad things are happening and we need to help stop that. We need to stand up, we need to tell our government to do what it can, we need to protest, we need to help people wherever we can. When bad things are happening, we tend to know who the victims are. And we can usually tell who the perpetrators are. The Holocaust had lots of people that were in neither of these categories. They weren't victims, they weren't perpetrators. They were the bystanders. I'm not looking, I know nothing, I'm gonna go on with my life and pretend it's not happening in my neighborhood. Well, that doesn't work. You have to be the upstander, you have to do something, you have to say something. When you see somebody being mean to someone else for no, for no good reason, just because they look different or they're from a different uh, group, you say something, you say stop it, don't do that, it's not nice, it's not okay. Because the Holocaust started with words. It didn't start with gas chambers, it started with words. And people thought that if they were mean enough, then later on, you know, just things got worse and worse. So that is the lesson here. We need to be upstanders. I want to thank CITV. I want to thank the Vermont Holocaust Memorial for letting me put this production together. And have a nice day.